recording in progress. We are, that tells us with certainty that we are making progress. We are with David Buto once again. David, how's it going today? It's going well. Thanks, Dan. So uh, we have a lot to cover, a lot to talk about. And I kind of feel like because we've known each other a long time, we could probably talk about things pretty much all day long and never run out of stuff to talk about. But we've got quite a list here. And uh, today's talk is literally more boiled down to the logistics of actual photography itself from a very brief touch on where assignments come from to the cameras you're using in the field, how you approach a scene, what you're looking for, your post-production, that kind of thing. But we're also at the end going to talk about your book, which is um, my copy is somewhere in the ether between California and New Mexico. We just don't know exactly where in the ether that is. And then you've got a workshop too that you want to mention that I want to make make sure that people are aware of. But the first thing we need to talk about, because you sent me an email and said, hey, can we touch on this, which I think is great timing, is artificial intelligence. And uh, I was going to say AI and AI not as in Allen Iverson of the Sixers or uh, artificial insemination, which I saw as a kid on the ranch, which is not pretty. But we're talking about artificial intelligence specifically when it comes to photography and photojournalism to be even more specific. And this is a very sort of touchy subject for you and rightly so. But can you Give us a little explanation of what happened recently with the Times and an image they ran of Trump and then not Trump. Yeah, so I thought it was really interesting last week when Trump tweeted out that he he said he was going to get arrested last Tuesday. And um, I think that generated uh, all these people coming up with AI generated memes of Trump getting a, Trump getting arrested. So yeah. there was there was one person in particular who had a whole Twitter thread where they used um, not from getting the name of the site right now, but to generate these these images that look pretty real of yeah. Trump surrounded by cops, Trump getting dragged away and all that kind of stuff. And there was, you know, there was, it was designed to be amusing. Right. And it was, they were so kind of over the top and so absurd that I don't think anybody really believed them or, you know, hardly anybody really believed that it was right. real past the first half a second of looking at it. But I thought it, it on, on Wednesday of last week, the, the New York times ran a picture that I don't, I don't know if it was AI generated or if it was Photoshopped, but it was, was a picture it was a black and white image of a of a courtroom with trump sitting on the witness stand with no no one else in the courtroom there were all these empty seats but at at first glance and i mean even even deeply looking at it and this was this was online i don't know if they ran it in print but it looked like a real photograph and it was accompanying an editorial so something in the opinion mm. section so it was not you know it's not designed to be a news picture and and on the credit it said photo illustration by okay the there we go did it so that was sort of the times out Right. But I just thought I, I was I was disappointed to see them put that in the same week that all these other fake pictures were being generated, because I think it's it's confusing to readers to, to see that. And I, I just think it blends, you know, imagination and reality a little bit too much in what, you know, is ostensibly one of the serious papers in the world, newspapers in the world. So, yeah, yeah but, I think. But the, Sorry, ahead, if, if, I, if I may just add that by the end of the day, they had changed it and they removed the original image and replaced it with just the photograph of the courtroom, which was a picture mm. by Getty. It didn't say the name of the photographer, but it was a Getty image just of an empty courtroom somewhere. But Trump, the image of Trump was was gone was from gone. the second version. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because when the, you know, AI probably landed on my radar screen on a daily basis in regards to photography about somewhere between six and eight months ago, maybe is when I first started hearing it all the time, pretty much somebody in my circles or online circles was talking AI and photography and my, I mean, I'm jaded. So I, my first thought was going back to Nat Geo, moving the pyramids, uh, Texas monthly, putting Ann Richards head on someone else's body, uh, Newsweek altering OJ Simpson. And I'm like, and I remember when Newsweek altered the OJ picture and there was somebody in the PJ circles out there, an editor that was interviewed. And the guy was like, oh, don't worry about this whole Photoshop thing. We will govern ourselves. And I was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. So my first thought with AI was, OK, this is going to get so out of control so fast. And then maybe you know, the wave crests and rolls back and we come to our senses somewhere down the line. But when you think about AI, in especially with photojournalism in particular, and I think we need to remind the audience of how specific that genre is in regards to not manipulating 
images. And I think you and I both know, know photographers who've lost their jobs over doing things that were less than, you know, on the up and up. And so, you know, in photojournalism, you're not supposed to, to change things. And so what is, what, when you first heard about this AI thing landing, what was your take on what it was, what it was going to do to photojournalism? Well, I think one of the, and, and I tell you, it's, it's moving so fast. I mean, photography and photojournalism in particular is just one narrow little slice. I think of the way that AI is going to change the way we see things, change the way we think about the world and kind of experience reality. I mean, you know, it's happening faster than we can really understand its impact, I think. Um, so I, I didn't even really think of AI and kind of blending in a sense with photojournalism. I don't think I thought of it until last week, really, because I mean, um, you know, I, I knew that people were using it in sort of like the sort of like the fantasy game world, you know, sure. stuff of the the idea of creating a surreal imagery, whether it's still or moving in imagery. I mean, that, you know, that's pretty obvious, right? Like any technology is like, you know, it's going to get used that way right away um, to, to where it's basically a tool for people's imagination. Mm. But as a reflection of what's really out there and i mean i know that you can get into deep discussions about what reality is and how humans perceive that and all that but in in the way that we most people experiencing it most people experience it it where you you see something and if you're with a group of people and you 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 all kind of recognize that you've seen the same thing you know a red car is driven down the street something like that most people are going to agree about that and that's sort of what photojournalism is at its core is capturing something that most people who were there i think can agree on and you're interpreting it in a in a way in the way you frame it you know and the timing yeah. like you just mentioned timing but um so yeah i think it i think it remains to be seen and i mean i can't i mean you know that whole space is moving so fast i just think there's no way to know in a year or 5 years or 10 years what that's going to mean for this part of the profession. I mean, I think for me, I look at it a couple of different ways. I know that marketing teams from brands all over the world are already using it to write marketing copy. You've got people writing short, using it to enter short story contests and poetry contests. And photographers have won contests with AI generated work that they didn't admit to until after the fact. That's all the kind of stuff that I, you know, I think is, is going to be out there. And I, I think that's only going to get more and more pronounced. It's going to get better and better. But like I look at it from the photographer side, not necessarily from the, the photojournalism side, but if you're, a commer if you're a working for a brand and you are looking for a photographer to do some things with the brand, that means currently you have to engage with a human. You have to reach out, negotiate with them. They bid, you do all this where now someone in that same agency can just say, you know what, just use just AI some, some mock-ups. And at some point, very, very soon, they're just going to say, you know what, those mock-ups are fine. Because, and I think in great part, it's due to how the, the time frame of how short an image is relevant in today's space. It's so short. You know, uh, 10 years ago, it was like a two-week maturity window when an image, and that was at the beginnings of digital. And I think now it's just people are constantly putting stuff out, looking for the reaction they want. If they don't get it, it's gone. They replace it with something else. And I think AI will probably impact a lot of commercial advertising people, automotive, that kind of thing, which is not, in my opinion, a good thing. It's just a, a, a part of it, which I think is what makes making unique work probably the single most important thing you can do, because if it's outside the bounds of what the algorithm is going to create, then you've still got, you know, that validity to your work. But again, we could go down the rabbit hole of, of AI and we could talk Alan Iverson. If you want to talk Alan Iverson or the artificial insemination, we should skip because again, That's I saw it as a kid and it's not something I want to talk about. Yeah. I, except maybe on your other podcast, you can talk about that. Yeah. Right? That's the other you're, paywall you're gonna... podcast where, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Growing up a ranch kid, you see all kinds of things that you, you, you can't, you can't un unsee. Yeah, let me let me just if if I if I may just weigh in a, a little bit on what you said. I mean, I, I I agree with everything you said, and I think in the commercial space, I can see AI being adopted very quickly, very soon. Yeah. Just like you said, going from mock-ups to conceptual ideas to no, this is actually a way for us to create the final product, and that's where uh, kind of like you you know the the 
the organization or the person who wants who's generating this campaign they want a certain scene they want a certain type of person or equipment in the picture and it's just way it can be way more efficient just to do sure. all this by a computer and you're not trying to make something look no one real no one has the expect expectation this is a, that this is actually a slice of real life so i, I, I think yeah go ahead go ahead yeah so i th i think that you know in the uh you know, I think there's there's a difference between that context and where if you're doing it for a very specific kind of commercial context or you're trying to do something for whatever reason that is kind of like eye candy, like you described the two week sort of lifespan, you know, and I, I mean, to make something that's very interesting and visual, visually engaging in the moment, maybe it's got elements of things that people are talking about, right, you know, right at that sort of like short period of time. I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, might, are kind of more interested in, in making images that are going to last longer. And I think it remains to be seen as this technology progresses. And it's, to me, it's what's, it's less interesting to me about how photographers are going to adopt this because you know they're going to be people that are going to adopt every bit of technology that gets rolled out. So that's not the question. The question is how the audience, just the general public, is going to be absorbing this and what are their interests going to be and what's going to stick with them over the long term. And is that going to be something that comes mostly from somebody's imagination or is it going to be something that exists out in the real world? So, you know, I, I don't think we know the answer to that. Yeah, I think, and I, maybe I'll just end with this. Maybe I have a, a weird take on this, but, um, you know, I see like the Dungeons and Dragons players, they're going to love AI and the fantasy land. But, um, and yes, I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid. I actually look to the art world here to help us find the boundaries of, of where things are going. And I think one of the things I love about the art world and the photography art world in general is that anything is possible and everything is on the table at any one time. If you, whatever your concept is, if you can prove relevancy to the concept and skill in the concept, then it's fair game. And I think the art world is purposely here to drive us crazy, but I think it will, it will help define the boundaries of where AI ends up in photography. Because to your point, journalism, you don't necessarily want people AIing you know, riot so-and-so, you know, happens and then you fabricating a picture that may or may not reflect the reality. But I think for these other genres, I think I actually look to the art world in some twisted way that it's it's in partly in their hands to help us define what this is in the future. And, um, yeah. and you know, the art world's filled, filled with strange people who do these things full time, thankfully. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I mean, if you think about um, the, the technology that was required to, to paint the Mona Lisa, just off the top of my head, right? Yeah. You know, that's that's much more basic than an AI generated image. But is as the AI generated image, are people going to be any more impressed or interested in that ten years from now than they are with the Mona Lisa? I I don't I don't know. Maybe it's but, uh, but yeah, yeah good but, question. But you know, I think technology is just a tool. So I think that it's you know, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna expand the kinds of things you can do. But I think to your point about the art about art, the real question is what's gonna stick with people, you know? Um, uh, I also think over too, the long you, term. You just mentioned something really interesting, which reminded me of a quote from another photojournalist that I've known for the bulk of my entire adult life. And and when Photoshop landed and sort of we went through that phase of going way too far with the new technology, his question to me was, when did life get so boring? In the sense that why, do, why would we need to go that far when what you're already photographing is so dramatic in mm. itself? And I think AI will probably go through that functionality as well, where we'll go way too far and just do some crazy stuff. And then the title break and we'll roll back and be like, all right, let's Let's get back to our senses and admit that Miami Vice was the best television show in history. Like we've <laughs> we've never done anything better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so not too, skip, yeah. go I was well, I wanna, not, not too many people are dressing like that at the, anymore, except at parties. Except at eighties parties. Yeah, I was going to say, but everything it, it comes in cycles, my yeah, friend. No, no, it's true. Yeah, no, I got to bust out my leisure suit with the really wide lapels after this conversation. So yeah, I had sleeveless shirts and a, and a white suit that I wore. But I was in like middle school, so you got to cut me a little bit of slack. And I was in yeah. Texas, so like Miami yeah. just seemed like the most exotic <laughs> cocaine playground I'd ever seen. 
Um, <laughs> so I want to just skip skip through these next things relatively quickly. But um, how did you get discovered, basically, as a photographer? And I mentioned to you this before we started uh, filming. As when I was coming up as a photographer, uh, another photographer made introductions to me in New York, and I, I made a trip to New York with my portfolio, and I went to agencies and editors and art buyers and all that, and showed my stuff around. I did portfolio reviews, and then slowly, you know, I just sort of got traction. Is that? Did you follow a similar path? What? How did that work for you? I I, th I think so. You know, I mean, there, there's a big difference between uh, when you're working on staff at a at a newspaper like I did, or or a wire service, um, and then you decide to to go freelance, and that's a that's a trajectory that a lot of photographers end up doing, and was very common, like in the '90s when 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 I did the same thing. So when you decide to make that break with your employer, and then you're suddenly self-employed, and then you need to go out and find these clients. In those days, in the '90s, really, like a physical trip with your physical portfolio to New York was the way to do it. And you would just, you know, call as many editors as you could find and make those appointments and go see them. Did you? I, I almost it almost sounded like you said call these people, which is hilarious to me because you could call people and they even if they didn't know you they would op they would pick up the phone and that's how i got meetings in new york and la with the call like the photo editor of a magazine there was no i mean email was around but it wasn't like the driving force there was no like texting as much and you could literally call and they would pick up the phone, which today yes. is virtually impossible. Like Virtual, getting, I can't even get my mother on the phone, let alone <laughs> like some editor I don't know. But OK, right. so that's that's pretty par for the course. And then just just briefly, um, whether you whether it's talking about the past or now, assignments come from a variety of places. But if I had to categorize it into two, it would be self-generated and then also assignments coming from third parties, magazines, editors, clients that have an idea already. They're coming to you because they think you're a good fit. Is that pretty accurate as to how the assignment thing works? I I, I think it is. It's it's both. You know, uh, just like you said. I mean, it can work can work either way. Like if there's something that you're interested in covering as a photographer, maybe. You know, I mean, you know, maybe it's some unusual rodeo that you hear about or something like that. And and you think that that could be fit with some magazine that might be interested in that. And you it, it helps if you already have a relationship with the photo editor there. But even if you don't, you know, I mean, these days everything is done by email. Right. So then maybe you're sending an email to that photo editor saying, hey, I want to go to this rodeo in Albuquerque uh, next weekend. Uh, are you guys interested? You know, and um they, you know, if they are, it may, you know, it, it, it may pique the curiosity of that magazine or, uh, you know, what is maybe more likely is they'll say, well, just go do it and then send me the pictures afterwards and maybe we can do something with it. The reality is that most journalistic magazines, and I, don't, I don't mean just news magazines, but I mean any, you know, any magazine that's really it's it's about, you know, words and words and pictures where they have writers who are working on stories. Um, most of those stories, the vast majority are generated from the writers, from the writing oh. side. The same goes for newspapers. That's just the tradition of it. So it's 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 much easier for a writer to pitch a story to a to an editor at the at the let's say the magazine and then photo is brought on board that's a much more common way of of how things work but now and then a photographer will pitch an idea and the photo editor can sort of push the writing side push the editors on that side and the managing editor to get interested in a project occasionally they'll even sign or assign a writer for it so mm -hmm. take yeah, note think, my friends yeah get to i think know those a, writers yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that, yes, that's exactly right. And there are a lot of, you know, uh, there are a lot of very successful photographers who I think have, have, um, have been able to do a lot because they have good relationships with writers and they, they work with them very closely. Um, and then, and then the other way to get assignments, I mean, is just, just, you know, the other thing that you described, which is just, you're on the radar of a particular photo editor and you're in the right place and the kind of work you do, they think it's just a good fit for that particular story. So, you know, there's different ways to get on the, on the radar. I mean, I, uh, you know, we mentioned Instagram, which I know you don't like last time. That is a way that, that photographers are getting on photo editors radars is by, is just by yeah. posting on on ig so you know you, you all can decide whether or not you want to do that but uh <laughs> it's sort of like free advertising really you know is um 
So, you know, but 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 photo editors, I mean, they that's that's what they they like to look at pictures. So they're looking at just what's out there in the ether, you know, what yeah. what kind of pictures exist in all kinds of different formats, whether it's social media or they see stuff in other publications. Maybe they've never worked with a particular photographer, but they see something, you know, in a in a magazine or a newspaper. And they're like, oh, that person's good. I want to call them, you know, next time. So. Yeah, I've had a ton of conversations with editors who, when I asked how they found certain people, said I saw their work in another, whatever competitor publication or an unrelated pub, and said I definitely want to work with that guy yeah. or that person, and um, mm -hmm. that's great. So, okay, I'm going back to this special rodeo in Albuquerque that you've discovered, um, and then I'm wondering like how I didn't discover it first, and now I'm I'm jaded and I'm I'm mad at you, but. Um, Okay, so we, we're skipping That's forward a little bit. It's just an AI-generated rodeo. It's not a real rodeo. rodeo. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm still jealous. It's, just, it's imagination, yeah. Al New Mexico is mine. Just remember that. <laughs> so if I, I'm photo editor in New York, um, I'm not entirely sure that New Mexico is part of the United States, so I'm intrigued by this rodeo story. And I call you in Los Angeles and say, you know, David, I want you to go do this project, and you've got whatever. It's two day two day event. I want you to shoot for two days. What are you taking with you on that trip equipment wise? Hmm. I usually take, um, you know, if, if I'm getting on a plane somewhere or I'm getting in my car for more than like a half a day trip, I usually take three cameras with me because okay. you figure, I mean, just as kind of a, just to have the backup. Yeah. I, I mean, um, and so I, I like, I started using Leica range finders in the nineties with the film cameras and, um, I don't use them for everything all the time, but I just, that something about the way I see when I'm using those cameras, I, I I know that you two have used them and love them, and I just yep. end up getting different stuff. So I usually have one or two digital Leica rangefinders with me, and then I usually have a mirrorless camera with me. And I've gone through, you know, I've used practically every system that you can think of over the years, you know. And I was using Nikon's a few years ago when I was working in Washington a lot, and I was using telephoto lenses a lot, and just kind of needed something quick. I've been using those a little bit less lately, but I have a Leica SL2S, which I've been using oh, yeah. for a couple of years, a mirrorless camera, which kind of functions like a, just any, you know, almost like a DSLR as well, just a good mirrorless camera. So I usually have that, which you, which you can also shoot video on, which is great to have some video capability when you're out there, even if you're not planning on doing it for the assignment or whatever, just to have a good quality video camera. And if I think it's, if there's a chance I might want to roll some video, I'll take a good external microphone with me, maybe a lav mic or a, a hot shoe style mic for the camera. And then, um, yeah, and then I mostly like using fixed lenses. So I, you know, I have like a fixed 28, 35, a 50. That's kind of my wheelhouse. Those are the lenses I use 90% of the time, but I'll have a tele, you know, one or two telephotos, either a, a fixed tele or a, or a telephoto zoom with me also. But when I'm out actually working, I rarely have more than two cameras with me, unless it's a news event where I need one for a telephoto zoom, you know, and I'm just, I know I'm going to be using that all the time, all day long. So I'll have one camera that's dedicated as a telephoto camera. Um, but most of the time it's just going to be a couple of cameras with those like short prime lenses on it. So it's interesting because, um, I was very similar. I had like a range finders going back to like 1990. There was just something about that camera that when I picked it up, I was like, Oh, this is going to be really good for me. I think the like is really limiting except for the one thing that it's really built for, which is reportage and, and sort of storytelling journalism news, that kind of thing. And I don't think there's anything ever been built. That's any better than those, those cameras, but it reminds me of something I heard probably in the nineties, which you just referenced, which was how many, and I think the last time I saw you in the field with cameras was San Diego. I think you were at the San Diego 96 political convention. Did yeah, I was that? there. I was, yes, I yeah. did. Yeah, and well, and you so had like a yeah. film film cameras. I had like a mm. film cameras. Half the people that were at that event had like a film cameras. But somebody around that time when Canon came out with their zoom lenses and autofocus, and Nikon was like, ah, it's a fad. And then like eight, <laughs> they lost like eighty percent market share in two years to Canon yeah. and autofocus and zooms. Yeah. I think it was Chris Morris that said like, and and maybe it wasn't him because I don't think he was a Leica guy. But you'd always see photographers with a Leica around their neck, and then they'd have two. SLRs with like zooms and they were like, yeah. these are the, these are the cash register. Yeah. And this, this is who I actually am as a photographer. And what's interesting about you in my mind is that you kind of 
went all in on the Leica and said, this is really who I am. And this is what I want to make as a photographer. And then, you know, the zoom and the long lens and everything is there because it's essential and it fits to something that you can't do with the Leicas necessarily. But I find it interesting that you kind of were successful in flip-flopping that equation because I think the majority of photographers out there wanted to do the same thing and either couldn't do it or didn't do it for whatever reason. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I remember that period very well. I mean, I've, I've talked to other photographers about this and it's sort of like, you know, photographers who are in their 20s or 30s, this is just sounds like we're talking about something during World War One or whatever. But yeah. when, when the Canon EOS system came out and the 20 to 35 was just yeah. like it was just like a mind blowing breakthrough. Suddenly, you could have instead of carrying two or three wide angles, you just needed one, and then you just didn't need the bag. I mean, it really and and the same with the tele, you know, with the eighty yeah. to two hundred two eight. It, it just really completely the changed the way photographers carried their stuff. Like yeah. You know, when I started out, everybody had like a donkey bag, and you know, you were like weighted down on one side with all these extra lenses, and. um and then when the Canon system came out, that just went away. And you're right. It was like two cameras with those two zooms. And then if you had a Leica, I don't know. I just liked using the Leica so much that I did decide to go all in. And I felt like the pictures that I was taking with those cameras were, were they were just somehow different than what I was getting with the, with the Canons. Because I, I switched too from Nikon to Canon in those days. And I mean, you know, it was a great system. And there's stuff that I was able to do with those Canons that you, I just couldn't have done before. But the kinds of pictures that I really wanted to make, I didn't need a zoom. You know, I didn't need a telephoto. Um, I didn't necessarily need a fast motor drive or anything like that. So um, I did go all in maybe to my detriment. You know, it's, you know, various points, but yeah. No, I think, um, I mean, I, I had a, when I was shooting Nikon, I had a 24, a 35, a 50, an 85, a 180, two eight, which was sort of the classic yeah, the longer classic, lens right. before the zooms came in. And I remember everybody had switched over. I was an intern. I was broke. I had no money. I sent all of that stuff to a place that Glazer's camera in Seattle, which at the time was taking all the Nikon equipment in and swapping it for people's for Canon stuff. And the guy's like, you know, dude, I'm so overloaded with old Nikon stuff. And so the only thing I, I sent all of that two F4s, all the drives, everything. And I got one Canon A2E and those two zoom lenses. And I was like, oh my God, this is, and also like back button autofocus and yeah. all the things that I was like, mind blowing. Yeah. But the, I was in the same boat. There was something that like haunted me about not having and shooting with the Leica because I would go back and look at my work and there were things that all the pictures that lasted to me that were the onesie twosie pictures were all shot with the Leica. And I went to Cambodia in 96 and I had the cannons and I had my Leica. And that was the trip that for me, I, I just said, you know, I'm just going to go, I'm going to shoot the Leica. I'm just going to leave the Canon mm. in the hotel room. And I'm going to shoot Leica. And that was like the, and I think that's one of the deceptive things about a Leica rangefinder is it's not a camera that you want to dabble with. It's a camera that once you commit to it and you actually learn it, because how many photographers do you know, bought and sold their Leicas over and over and over again, because they never really committed to leaving the house with just that system and actually learning how it works. And so- <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I, I've, I've told people many times in workshop students and stuff who've maybe just gone out and bought a, a, a like a rangefinder is that even me, like when I, when I first started using them, like as a professional photographer who was like shooting five or six days a week, like all the time with all this experience. Anyway, even using manual focus when I started out, it's, it still seemed like it took me about a year. <laughs> Even then, to get it down where I was almost fast enough, as fast as I was with using an SLR in those days. So that's yeah. use, that's like that's why you're right. It is a commitment. You can't just pick it up every now and then and use it because it's just going to seem clumsy and slow, and you're just going to miss stuff all the time. So yeah, yeah you, just you, the, yeah. yeah. Even the loading, you know, watching. Mm. I, I remember watching like a guys. I think it was a boss when he was in San Diego at that same event, and watching wow. him reload his Leica without looking at it. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, there's a whole level of commitment here that I'm like not quite. I, I was a dabbler at that point. So, mm. but um, I want to move on a little bit mm. here and talk about. So you're on assignment. You're at this. You're at this AI generated rodeo in Albuquerque. <laughs> and when when you you get out of the car, you've got your cameras on, and your brain says, okay, I'm on. I'm here. I'm now. I'm on assignment. I've got to work. I've got to produce work. 
I, when I look at photography in general, the, the three things that jump out at me are light timing and composition. And for me, it's in that, it's in that, uh, ranking, but I'm not on assignment. I'm only doing my own work so I can pick and choose when I go into the field. Whereas if yourself, if you're on assignment and the rodeo starts at 2 PM and the light sucks, you still kind of have to be there at 2 PM and you're shooting. So when you look at a scene, what are, what are you, what are the ingredients that you're looking for and what order would you put those? I put them in very much the same order that you would. And, um, I think that, um, one of the things I, I like to try to do even before I show up to the scene is have some kind of intention in my mind about what I might be looking for on the scene, what kind of what my goal is. And if, and you know, there, there may be a, a variation if you're, if you're just doing it for yourself, or if you're doing it on spec, let's say where there's not a photo editor who's expecting certain pictures from you, you're just looking for good stuff and the kind of stuff that you're interested in. That's one headspace. And then that's sort of a sliding scale. If you're planning on sending it to somebody, you may think, oh, this photo editor might be looking for these sorts of pictures um, all the way to I'm on assignment and I'm trying to get them what they want and what they're expecting. So, you know, you that that that's going to be a range right off the bat. So on the way there, whether it's you're on the airplane or whether you're just in the car driving there, um, I like to, I'm starting to think about that already. And I'm starting to think about what the light is going to be when I show up there. And if it's 2 PM and it's sunny out, I'm like, okay, it's going to be pretty contrasty. So how, what am I going to do to work with that light? What kind of pictures, what kind of scenes might I encounter when I get there? And how am I going to deal with the light that, that's, that exists? So, um, um, that that helps a lot, I think. And 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 sometimes you're thinking about maybe the kinds of specific pictures that you're going to encounter. And then other times it might be a little um more ethereal in the sense of you're you're trying to convey something that you might not be able to describe in words right off the bat. But it's a mood, it's an atmosphere, right? Um, that you're hoping to to capture. So when I get out of the car and I'm walking through the parking lot on the way to that AI generated rodeo arena, um, you know, I'm I'm trying to um, I'm trying to get a feel for what it's like to be there, and what okay. does that mean to be there? You know, what does it sound like? What does it smell like? Is is there dust in the air? Is there music? What's the energy of the people that are there? And that's all like getting into my head, into my senses. So then I'm, if, if that's interesting to me and hopefully it will be, it's not always, you know, sometimes yeah. it's just not right off the bat, but I'm looking for something that's going to convey that when I first show up. So, and so shooting 28, 35, 50 is sort of, you said was your wheelhouse. I'm assuming that like other people that are using those focal lengths, when one of the primary things you're looking for is foreground, mid ground, background, you're looking for layers all working at the same time moments, and then in the right light it's, it's for me, that's the Holy grail photograph, which maybe happens a couple times a year when you like nail all of those things, foreground, mid ground, background in the right light with like actual movement. Is that is that the 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 main course that you're after? I think so. That's the idea. Um, I mean, it it may not always work out to like maybe all those those three uh, distance elements. You know, there there you may be missing uh, number one, and you have sort of a mid ground background thing, or it could be. So you know, I I think that um, I, I'm I'm usually thinking I would say roughly speaking in two different modes, and and the first mode is is what you just described, so that when you're using those focal lengths, particularly like let's say a 28 or a 35, you're thinking maybe more immersively. Okay. So it's like my first goal right off the bat is to take a picture that brings the viewer of these pictures into the scene. I want them to have a sense of what it's like to be there, what it feels like to be on the sidelines of that rodeo or where the where the cowboys are getting ready, you know? And it's like I want to bring them right in there and have that kind of visceral um visceral sense. Um and then in the course of that you might find that there are certain close-ups or certain details that may not have that same feeling of being immersive, but just make on its own 
just kind of like a very nice, pretty picture or a graphically interesting picture that that is like a, a detail, some kind of artistic impression that comes from the scene. And that might be more of like a 50 millimeter shot. I think when I first started out, I would have used the 180 for that. I would have been, <laughs> I would have been, you know, way back and I would have just isolated everything with that telephoto. Now I like, I just don't really like to do that because I'm feeling it more if I'm up close to the subject anyway. And I feel it's, like I've got some kind of connection there instead of being, uh, you know, a voyeur. So last night we had uh, some friends over and a couple and the husband uh, back in the 70s was a press guy. And we were talking about this and I was like, you know, what was the rig that you carried in the 70s? He goes 24 and 300 to eight. And I'm like, I was like, <laughs> that's the classic <laughs> newspaper. 24 is the immersive thing you're talking about. But the ultimate was the 300 to 8 because you could be yeah. so far back and just like pick off little isolated just, pieces. Just pick off. Yeah. Like a, like a, like a sniper, like a benevolent sniper or maybe not so benevolent, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you left to your own devices, are you a story always going to search story or are you a, a single photograph guy? If you have. Um, if you have your choice of photographing, you're going to look for singles or you're going to look for story. How about this answer? The answer is neither. Oh, the, Jesus. The, the answer is like, uh, and this is, I don't want to get too esoteric here, but no, no, go um, for it. But I think of what I'm most interested in. I, I, I would use the word essay rather than story. Oh. So when I, I, now it, a lot of it, we're getting into semantics a little bit, but a lot of yeah. it, when I think of somebody, you know, when people use the the, the description of photo story, I, I, I personally just think of that as sort of a linear narrative where you're okay. using photography to explain something, either how something happens or how it's unfolding, or you're using very, the, you know, the, the, the power of photography to, ver to be very descriptive and to show all the different elements of somebody's life or some situation, something like that. You know, maybe in the last 15 years or so, uh, 20 years, I've been kind of interested in things that are a little bit more ambiguous and so I'm, I, I think of myself less as, as a, as a, you know, somebody who's trying to create a narrative that is, that sort of explains something. Whereas I'm, I'm more, I'm more interested in things that are just impressionistic. And so okay. that could be a single picture. And sometimes I do just from an a photojournalist standpoint, sometimes I do want to take a single image that captures all the elements that I experienced that day. That is my goal. I think that's maybe, you know, when I'm traditionally working as a, as a photojournalist, particularly on assignment, that that is my goal. I am trying to do that. But if I've got the whole day or hours of photographing to do in some really interesting scene, I'm trying to bring out things that are maybe just may not make a lot of a lot of literal sense but are, I create an impression a visual impression of what i experienced uh at that place i it's interesting cuz i was i was same thing i studied journalism i was much more of a very linear photography uh, photographer i always kind of looked down a little bit on conceptual art photography or even just conceptual projects in general i thought a lot of people skated by on the idea of the concept but then their their application with the photography wasn't strong and I sort of like an idiot lived under that for many decades. And then one day I was kind of like, you know, I think the problem here is me. It's how I'm looking at this. And the fact that linear is not always the best way to get a story across that, that idea of amb ambiguity and also just mystery with what you're doing probably should be playing a much bigger role, which I find interesting. But I also love the fact that the single thing, because to me, that boils back down to someone in your case who started in the newspaper world, where often that was all you were ever going to get was a single image from a story. And then also in the magazine work that you did, because you're probably worth at the time, we're facing the same things, which is always a fight for space in the magazine. So it, you, you always had to boil down to the lowest common denominator was, which was I might only get one frame and that frame better have that entire story. Uh, otherwise, you know, maybe it's not going to have an impact or maybe I'm not going to get the call for the next assignment. So I think it's a great skill and, uh, and actually a hell of a lot harder than people know, especially people who don't do photojournalism. Uh, I think the art world in general has always kind of looked down on reality-based photography. There have been some great essays um, written about this very thing because 
I think there's a lot of people who have no understanding of what it is to go into the field, not manipulate and make an image that completely tell a single image that tells a story. It's so difficult. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, 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 I do. Sure. And, and again, like we're talking about all this stuff, you know, even bringing in like AI photography or art photography, I'm not saying any one is better than the other or, or, or it's harder than the other. I, I, I don't want to, I don't mean that. I don't think that it's really just a, it's, it's really up to the photographer to decide what it is that they want to do. And you're asking me about like what my process is and what my interest is is and so that you know there there is some variation of like if i'm just going out and taking pictures on my own versus when i'm on assignment because when you are on assignment you know you're getting paid uh for the for the pictures that you're that you're taking yeah. so you you know you do have a responsibility to your editor for that and yeah you know you have to think about what it is they want so the ideal circumstance for any photographer if they're working on assignment is to have an editor that's kind of saying we want you to shoot the kind of pictures that you like to shoot that's like a that's like a grant that's how i see it and you know i've, I've had the you know i've been lucky enough over the years to work with editors who who've kind of set the assignment up that way you know yeah it's so. i mean it was always weird to get uh, someone would look at your portfolio, see something, and then hire you to do something completely different. That was always a weird, yeah. you know, shoot a yeah. portrait on white seamless after they looked at a black and white essay from the border, and you and you'd be like, <laughs> "Why on earth did you hire me to do this?" So when it, when those times came up, which in my case were pretty rare, where an editor said, "Look, we hired you because you do what you do. We just want you to do that." I didn't really experience that a lot until I left journalism and went into things like portraiture and believe it or not, weddings where, you know, clients would say, look, I'm not telling you what to do. We've seen what you can do. Just, we want to get out of your way and just let you do what you do. And that, that sense of freedom, because you knew at that point you were going to make the best work you possibly could. It wasn't, nobody else had their fingers in the pie. It was all, all you, but if you blew it, it was also always all on you. So yeah, that, sure. that pressure right. kept, kept us warm at night. That's right. So just very briefly before, because I want to get to your book and also, uh, and there's a quite a few questions about the book. Your when your assignment's over, what is your post processing like? How do you handle files, and how do those hmm. get delivered to a client? Say, Sh sure, good question. Okay, um, so what I what I do is after after the after the shoot, I I download my cards, all my cards, and put them onto a you know a portable hard drive just so I have the raw files of everything I've done and then um then I'll I'll create a folder I use photo mechanic as my editing it. tool right I knew and, it and right and so when I when I say editing I'm using that in this the kind of OG sense of the word when I say editing what I mean is selecting the pictures that I like from a take I don't mean I I say post processing when I'm talking about using Lightroom or Photoshop but in any case so let's say I've got a card. Let's say I just shot one card, okay, or you know, two cards, doesn't matter. Anyway, so I'm taking those photos, all those pictures, I'm putting them into Photo Mechanic, which creates like a contact sheet. And it's a very easy way to go frame by frame. You can see the pictures different sizes. You can enlarge them to make sure that they're sharp or whatever. And then I select a broad edit. I select right off the bat everything that I like and everything that I think I might possibly like later. Okay, if that okay. makes any sense. Yeah. So it's probably about five times as many pictures as I'm actually going to send to the client or I'm going to keep for myself in the short term to work on. But this is a very, it's a broad edit. So it's stuff that I like. It's not just getting rid of the bad stuff. It's really narrowing it down. If I have a scene where maybe just with the same camera, same lens, I've got like 20 frames of the same person from slightly different angles and the moment is a little bit different. The angle to the light is a little bit different. By the way, yeah, you mentioned light right off the bat. That is like kind of like the first thing I see. I mean, because that's that to me is going to impact the picture, just sort of the aesthetics of the picture as much as anything else. In any yeah. case, you know, I'm finding those so I, I that that i call my broad selects and then um and then i go back sometimes i'll take all those pictures and i'll drag them into lightroom right okay. all all the broad edit and the to me the advantage of doing that is then i can do kind of like um a, a, a basic post processing on those pictures to give me a rough idea of of what it's going to look like. So sometimes that helps me decide which frame I like. 
if you get my meaning. So if sure. I have f- five favorite frames from those 20 of that same person, seeing them in the way that I'm going to post-process those pictures gives me an idea of which one of those frames is going to work best looking like that. Maybe it's slightly the, where the shadows opened up, which is sort of typical what you know I and a lot of people are doing these days from what the raw file is coming out of the camera. So sure. then from from there, you know, I, I I'll probably just then start to work on um, work on the frames that I like, but maybe fifty percent more than what I think I'm going to deliver to the client. Okay. So I've got some extra, right? Or if it's for myself. And I'm doing this essay. And a lot of times I'm just not sure, you know, and so you want, I think that this is part of the process of doing these kinds of edits when you've got the, when you have an end point in mind, whether it's an assignment or a photo essay that you're doing, either a small one or you're trying to do a book, is that you kind of need to see how everything fits together. So I do the post on these pictures. And then I look, I go back to photo mechanic because it's the easiest way to see these uh, in total. And a lot of times I'll look at it sort of like a, as a contact sheet on my monitor. So I might have my favorite 30 shots, let's say, and I think I'm going to send in 20. This is just off the top of my head. This is maybe a short assignment. Um, uh, but let's expand it a little bit. Let's say I've, I'm going to, I'm looking at 50 or 80 pictures on my contact sheet and I'm planning on sending in 30 or 40. So I'm going to start to narrow it down, but I'm going to see how all these pictures look together. And then you're using, you know, you're kind of, um, well, I, I'm, I'm getting into too much detail about the aesthetics of it, but, but it's, it's a way to see how your pictures look and what what they have from a content standpoint, and then yeah. also how they go together aesthetically, and those are going to be the sort of the metrics that you're using when you go to the next step. So so then um, uh, once I narrow it down and I've got a set that I think uh, uh, is is ready to send to the client, then I caption everything. So you go back and you put in you know captions oh, for all these pictures. Nightmare. Which is everybody's everybody's um, least favorite part of this workflow. Yeah, right? it's hellish. Uh, it's cruel and unusual. Can't, it can't it is especially but you know maybe AI will you know maybe it'll be a solution in 6 months that where we don't have to do this anymore. You know, but like when you have you know if you've got these different groups of people that you photographed in some cases you know you want to get people's names and you're identifying people and i don't always do that but depending on the client and the circumstance you may need to do that um uh and so you've got each frame has to have the caption that goes with that specific picture and then there's usually some kind of a i usually have a a sentence or two that's sort of like the broad description of what the whole thing is with each picture as well. And then I send it, you know, either via uh, WeTransfer or FTP in some cases, if the client prefers that to the client. And there's some, there are some photographers, particularly portrait photographers who work in a way uh, where they're sending in broad selects where they haven't done the final post-processing yet. Mm -hmm. And they're waiting for the client to come back and say, we, yeah, we like these three or four. So that does happen for me sometimes. You know, I did an assignment a couple of weeks ago where it was like, you know, portraits of these different executives and the client doesn't want to see like, it's sort of in a way it's to save everybody time, right? Sure. It's instead, instead of me spending hours to fine tune each single frame of 80 pictures, I'm just, you know, doing the basic post where things look pretty good and I'm sending that to the client. And then they say, oh yeah, we like the two pictures, of this person, two pictures of that person, it gets down to 10. And then you can spend a little bit more time on the post getting it yeah. uh, looking the way that you want. Yeah. I mean, when I lived in LA and worked for Kodak, I would go visit like celebrity portrait people and they would do the same thing. They would shoot. They were often tethered with the client in the other room. The client would be on the couch and this like viewing screen. It was all super high tech. But they would make their selects, and then those selects would not just go to the post production people; they would go to the retouchers. And mm. you know, you're talking about celebrity portraits. There was nothing untouched from head to toe on that person by the time the retouchers were done. I can remember going to remember Narduli Lab in L.A. Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so Philip Narduli had this amazing black and white lab. They probably did color as well. I just know him as a black and white guy. And there were retouching stations. I don't know if it was actually in Narduli or adjacent to Narduli, but one of these was one of the most important Mm -hmm. like celebrity portrait retouchers. And one day I got to go like visit her while Mm -hmm. she was working. 
and it was a winner of American Idol. It was a guy, I don't remember his name. And it was just a studio lit portrait of the guy, very nice work. And she had this clear overlay over the top of it with a grease pencil. And literally there was not, there was nothing on him that was not touched by the retoucher, including skeletal reconstruction. I mean, they were reconstructing his head, his neck and everything. And I made some like snide comment about the amount of retouching. And she said, she flipped down two more clear overlays and said, dude, you were only looking at round one. There were two more rounds of <laughs> retouching. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, right. If people, you know, I don't yeah. want to see him in real life because he's gonna he's gonna scare us all. But okay, so let's mm -hmm. transition here a little bit because we're talking about something that I think it's overlooked a little bit, especially in the prosumer realm of photography, which is you did a book, Brink, which was your your take on January 6th. You were there photographing that day. And when it comes to editing photographs. I don't know if there's a better masterclass than editing your work into book form. So let's talk a little bit about you, your, you're at January 6th, you make this work. How soon after that day was over, did you start thinking about the concept of doing a book? Well, the the book itself, um, and I'm sorry that it, it it's gotten lost in the the ether between here and- uh, It was, and, it was and, something you've been working on for a long time. It, the yeah, sixth so was the, sort of the final- the, final the six was the final piece of the book. So the yeah, I, I think there may be um, five pictures from January six in the book out of a hundred and two, I think in total. But that was really the, I mean, that day and that um, that event was was the thing that solidified in my mind that I had to do everything I possibly could to make a, a book of photos of of the whole narrative, really, which began before the election, you know, a few weeks before the election in 2016. So it starts there and then it goes through. Um, I mean, it, 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 you know, there's January 6th and then there's a few pictures after that that are kind of like the aftermath of that around the Capitol and then Biden's inauguration and then sort of a final picture of Trump at the very end, which was taken a, a few weeks later. But, um, you know, uh, sorry, what was your original question, Dan? Was it what was the, like, how did the I, original? Uh, yeah, the question was when. So let's go back to to uh, weeks before 2016 election, and you know Trump gets elected, which was a shock to a ton of people in the country, and no one really quite knows what's going to happen the next four years, or you know will go down in history. Definitely a unique set of years in in American you know experience. How soon into this process did the a concept of doing a book come to you? I think pretty soon. So I, I made the personal decision to move from Oakland, California, where I was living at the time during the election to Washington, D.C. So that was a commitment that I made. And I, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit in the first round of this conversation. Mm -hmm. But but, you know, because I was a political science major and I'd always been interested in the subject, but I'd never worked in Washington. I wanted to see just what it was like being there. And I thought if there's any time in my life to have this experience and and to try to do something interesting photographically of that subject this was going to be it so i i made the decision to to go to washington to do that and kind of like going back and forth for for a few months on and off to see if i like it liked it so at some point you know i'd kind of committed to the whole thing and and i mean it was uh somewhere between the the forefront of my mind and the back of my mind that I would like to do a book but I know you know books are difficult to do and I also didn't know what was going to happen you know so I I'm I'm you know taking pictures of a, of a of a narrative that's unfolding so you you, you know you can't think oh I'm going to do a book on this cuz you you don't really know if it's going to be that interesting of of a sequence of events or not but of course it turned out to be an extremely interesting uh uh, sequence and uh, and very important to my mind. So it was really it was sometime you know before, it was around the time of the 2020 election. You know it surprised me that Trump had stayed in office all those four years. Uh, so it was sometime during that election, you know, four years after the first one, that I thought oh, this is I need to start looking at all this as a, as a body of work. And then the six was just a uh, you know that was just that just sealed the deal for me. Um, you know, in terms of the motivation to put something together as a book. And how daunting was the editing experience of trying to pull together four years, four years plus of work um, in, a, in a sort of politically charged atmosphere? And there's also a timing element because you don't want this book to linger around too long. It's, it's timely. You want it to come out. So you 
um, tell us about the editing experience from start to finish, how long that took and what kind of outside help you had with that. So I had some outside help. It took a few months. Um, I mean, the, one of the things I'd been doing dur during those four years, I, I'd always kept some folders of my favorite pictures, you know, that I'd had been doing all along. So then when it came time, let's say at the end of, at the end of 2020 to start looking at everything I'd done, I had already, you know, I had already sort of pooled my favorite stuff. So Smart. that was a good place. That was a good place to start. And then, um, then I, you know, I use that opportunity to, to, to then go back and look at things maybe that I'd missed the first time around or pictures that in hindsight were kind of interesting. So um, I, I ended up with about, I think it was between seven and 800 selects in the beginning. Okay. So this was even before January 6th, I think. But I had these and I was in conversation with um, Jen Poggi, who uh, I had worked with. She was the national photo editor at US News and World Report for many of the years that I was a contract photographer. She's now at, at the Rochester Institute of Technology. She's a, a professor there. But um, you know, we had, you know, we, we had been in conversation and she'd worked in the white house during the Obama administration. And she was, she was very familiar with sort of like these types of pictures. And, um, uh, you know, she really helped me in the, in the beginning kind of look at this whole body of work and make sense out of it. Cause I'd been doing some things in black and white at the same time. So I didn't know, you know, is this going to be a book that's going to be both color and black and white? Is it going to have portraits in it what's it gonna you know what's aesthetically what's it gonna look like but we kind of talked it out and we decided it was going to be in color and it was going to be more or less of a of a of a linear narrative of those four years and then from there then it's a matter of you know chipping away chipping away you know finding sure. the stuff you, you know and i'll tell and you, you said, this just sorry go ahead no, the 102 images total yeah yeah okay down from 800 for yeah. selects. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's good. That's putting the screws to it. It's putting the screws to it. And you know, what makes it even, just as a practical matter, what made it even what brought in even more screws. I mean, the thing is, is that it's fun. It's not like it's agony because this is what you want to do. Right. I mean, you know, this is why I got into photography. So it's not like, you know, it's not like having the screws on you, but it is, it is a lot of work and you, it does make you think a lot about what you're doing. But let's say what would happen sometimes is that I would see a frame that I'd saved and I remembered being in that scene. And in hindsight, I kind of remembered I, 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 like something else that I saw that seemed like that would really work now. The two years have gone by and there was this other thing that I saw at that particular hearing and it wasn't that interesting to me at the time, so I didn't save it. So then I'd go back and then I'd have to oh. go back to the raw, you know, the card, the original <laughs> card with, you know, 400 pictures on it. And then you're going back. And then in the process of finding that picture that I forgot about or that I, I, had, I had didn't hadn't saved the first time, then I would see 10 other pictures oh. that I hadn't thought about. So suddenly you start out with 800 and you think you're narrowing it down. Then all of a sudden you're actually adding. There's more pictures in the mix. So it, uh, you know, it, it becomes a kind of a Rubik's cube. You know, you're really trying to weigh these things out and that just forces you, um, to think really seriously about what it is that you're trying to do with the book, you know, aesthetically, so I, from a narrative standpoint. Yeah. Go ahead. Pe people think I'm, I'm saying this because I work for blurb, but I always say like, you know, the book makes you a better photographer because, it makes you apply critical thought to your work. What do you have? What do you not have? What holes are in the story? And so I, I totally agree. I think it's, um, and, and also the fact that there's such a thing as a full-time picture editor, you know, and I've seen full-time picture editors make edits on stories that were just simply head and shoulders above the photographer or anyone else involved in the project. They could just see it because they they're used to looking at images all day long, every day. And, um, you know, they just knew, knew how it worked and, and how it fit together. So it's, um, you know, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, there's, there's two things. One is that it's, it's always good, no matter how good of a photographer somebody it is, it's always good for them to have outside eyes looking at stuff. 
right? Because For sure. you're, you're not, I mean, it may be the case, like if you're doing a blurb book, and by the way, I'm not saying this just because you, you work with blurb, but when I've done workshops, I've always encouraged my students, if you're working on some kind of a project, think about doing a blurb or some other self-publishing book, because just knowing that you're going to do that, or you're trying to do that makes you much more critical in the good sense of the word critical about your work. You think about your pictures in a much more, in a much deeper way and a much more complex way. You're not just looking at it. Well, do I like this or not? It's like, oh, what is that actually saying? And sometimes asking those questions requires bringing in somebody else. What do you think of this? Does this fit? That kind of thing. And so there's just outside eyes. And then there are professional photo editors who are really good at doing this. Those people have those jobs for a reason. They're not, you know, uh, it, it, they have skills that just regular old photographers don't have. They, they bring something else to it. And, um, certainly, you know, that was the case with Jen. And then as we got, I'll just tell you, as we got things narrowed down a little bit more, and I actually had the sort of the basic structure of what I thought this book was going to be. I brought in another photo editor that I'd worked with at us news, a guy named Olivier Picard, who's also fantastic. I mean, I brought these two people in for a reason and, um, and between the three of us, essentially, that's, that's how the, that's how the book was edited. And you know, I had the final came, say in the end, me, it was me. It wasn't the publisher. It wasn't them. It was me. Did you, but did you just go like this? <laughs> this was it. What Something speaking like of, so the book is edited. How did the material choices of the book come together? Trim size, uh, hardcover, softcover, paper type. How many copies right. did you print? How did all that come to be? Right. So my intention with the book all along, which is right here, by the way, this is a, a fantastic cover design that was done um, by the by the publisher's designer, designer um, Nicola. And um, I wanted the experience of somebody who had this book and they're flipping through all these pictures to be as different as possible in book form as it would be if they were looking at the stuff on their computer or TV, because most people had been experiencing this as news events and they're looking at stuff online on news sites, on Twitter, whatever it is. And so that's their experience is a computer screen that's contrasty. You know, sometimes the pictures are really small and all along I was shooting pictures that to me, I was trying to make pictures during those four years that might not be that great small, but that were really designed to be, to be large where you could really like, I mean, just randomly, I just happened to open up the book to this page, but this is, this is right after, this is the East room of the white house right after Trump was acquitted by the Senate in the first impeachment trial. So, you know, that's him here speaking to all these people. So to me, just from, I mean, aesthetically, this particular picture is not super interesting, but from a historical standpoint, I think it's pretty yeah. interesting because yep. you can go back and look and see who all these people are who are laughing with him and applauding him. Okay. So, um, that's the kind of picture that I wanted to make. And so in order to do that, you know, I wanted something of size. So this is, um, I forget what the actual dimensions are, the exact dimensions are, but it's, it's, I think it's roughly eight by 12. And so, okay. and then we choose, we chose uh, the, uh, I mean, I wanted a, essentially a matte paper or more or less kind of soft, not, it's not exactly matte, but sort of not, not a contrast. It's super not gloss. Bright. It's not gloss. It's not like it's a little bit muted. And I wanted the pictures to look that way because uh, when you're looking at stuff on the computer, it's always contrasting and colorful. And that's what mostly that's what, you know, people's experience was. So I wanted to, to, to take them out of that and to have it be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more artistic. You know, this was, uh, this is Senator, you know, Jeff Flake. That's from the, that that's the famous hand. Flake, Flake photo. That's a great image. Yeah. Well, thanks. It is pretty good. And it was just, you know, it was a combination of things that makes it, make it a good picture. You know, a lot of it, a lot of that just being luck, most of it probably, but, um, and, and but how anyway, many copies yeah. did you print? So we printed 700. So it was printed in Italy. The, the, the publisher is, is Punctum Press, which is a small publisher based in Rome. And they're, you know, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to work with them is that they're very close to their printer, which is on the outside of Rome. They have a very good relationship. It's very, very tight. And I knew that the quality control was going to be great with the printer. And aesthetically, I think we were all kind of in alignment between me, the 
you know, the the designer and the and the publisher, uh, Marco Delogu of uh, of Punctum. So I I, I had uh, you know a lot of confidence that that you know that the the feel and the aesthetics and the printing of the book were were going to go well. Which yeah, that's a, it's 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 important. It's a relationship. You know, when you get into a publishing cycle, it's the family that you want to have around, and not the crazy uncle that you're not uh, not too sure is going to do the right thing. So, mm-hmm. anytime I hear a good positive publishing story, it makes me super happy. Obviously, I'm a huge believer in photo books. I think it's one of the most important things photographers can do, and also one of the things that lasts because if you're able to get them into the library network in the country or you know, into institutions where these are going to be on the shelves for decades and a lot of people are going to learn from them in the future. So the last thing I want to point, yeah, yeah, is to make something tangible that's going to last. The last thing before we, we exit this little interview is you mentioned something a minute ago, which was about a workshop that you have coming up. What's that about? Well, I'm planning on, I I haven't set dates yet, but I'm planning on doing a workshop in the late spring, early summer in Los Angeles. So it's, it's going to be, um, uh, both a sort of a, a shooting and a project workshop it could be some something for um, uh, somebody who, who's who already has a project that they're trying to narrow down a little bit. Um, maybe they're going to do a book or you know, an exhibit or something like that. So they're adding to that or they're starting fresh. They just kind of want a fresh start and find some new things to photograph. So um, anyone who in your audience who's interested in that if you can write to me at zenphotoworkshop at gmail.com and just put the, the the word workshop in the subject line, I will add you to the mailing list for that. And that's say that email address one more time. So it's zen, Z-E-N, photo with P-H, photo workshop. So zenphotoworkshop at gmail.com. And if for some reason that kicks back, just you can write to me at davidbuto at gmail.com. But uh, my first choice is to have you send it to the workshop um, email. Keep things organized. That's right. Awesome. So, well, I think that's about covered the bases that I was hoping to cover today. I so appreciate you taking time to do this again. I know you're busy, but I love having these conversations and love learning just the perspective how I I think you and I had some very similar, I mean, similar things in our lives, both went to UT Austin, both went into the photojournalism world, but then also our careers were completely different once that time period. So it's always fun to hear insight into how you looked at things, how you worked. uh, And then also, you know, the last, uh, the last five, six, seven years of your life have been pretty interesting and congrats so much on the book. I think that's a monumental statement that um it looks gorgeous thanks so much dan i i I really appreciate it It it's great to talk to you great to catch up anytime and uh we'll probably have to do this again at some point but thanks again and we'll um we'll talk soon cheers thanks everyone for listening